Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you guys are fine. <laughs> yeah, so the, the topic of our panel session is crypto in Africa, strengths, gains, and the future. So before I start, I would like to explain what this means. If, as a Nigerian, I'm very sure you have a friend, a relative, or a colleague in crypto, even if you are not trading crypto yourself. So crypto is actually mainstream in an to an extent in, in Nigeria and Africa. But this has brought a conversation. Trading crypto in Africa has brought both pains and gain. We are talking about the strengths, we are talking about the pains, the displeasure, the hardship we faced. We are not we are only talking about the dips or the market crashes. We are talking about the regulatory difficulties, the hardship that comes with using crypto in Africa. Then we are talking about the gains. We are not only talking about the pumps or the gains in the market space. We are talking about the dividends that the blockchain technology has brought to Africa. Then we are also talking about the future. Like, okay, now, we've seen the gains, we've seen the pains. What's next from here? So these pressing questions are going to be are going to be answered by seasoned blockchain innovators and regulators that we have around. The first person I'm going to be calling is Chris Hani, founder and CEO of Daba. <laughs> Second person I'm going to be calling is Senator Iene, the president of Sigan. A round of applause, please. The third person on our list is Buchi Okoro, CEO of Kudas. The next person is Ruth Isalema, CEO of Bitmama. Yeah, I'm also going to be calling Chinedu. Obi Diego, the product manager as Luno. We are going to be joined online by two speakers, Osami De, Arion Winde, CEO of GigX, then Sandy Pitex, CEO of 3A. Welcome, guys. So, cryptocurrency has caused the conversation in Africa. You know, what exactly is the cause of cryptocurrency in Africa? Can it be attributed to the block, the technology behind the, te the technology behind the blockchain, or is it just a money-making scheme, a poverty eradication scheme? I would add that question to Christian. What exactly is the cause of cryptocurrency in Africa? Is it a money-making scheme? Is it a poverty alleviation scheme? Or the surge in the usage in Africa, is it, is, is it, is it due to the technology behind it? Um, crypto in Africa, uh, crypto in Africa for me is more of a tool for economic development or economic freedom. Because uh, uh, if you look at the limitations we have in Nigeria or Africa, let's just use practical solutions. I keep telling people that everything so many fintech companies want to solve, a simple stable coin like USDT has solved it. Uh, some years back, I think in 2019 or so, I was doing a tour across some African countries. And while we were doing our crypto and Bitcoin seminar and all that, Ghana, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Benin Republic, yeah. And throughout the, this whole mission across this country, the major thing I was using as a means of exchange or whatever is uh, USDT BTC. Okay, for an average uh, user, for, for an average person in Africa, for instance, uh, money transfer is a big deal. I am sure you're here, uh, the card you're using, there is currently a limitation. They've changed it from $100 to probably 20 US dollars. In my company, for instance, there are certain things we pay for that we don't even use uh, our bank, our Naira bank card. So we have to send money to somebody who is in Rwanda to via USDT. The person sells 
this thing via Binance uh, P2P and funds his own debit card in Rwanda just to make simple thing, sim something for like an email server, sim the one you use to pay for Facebook ads, the card we use, we have to send USDT, we have to send crypto to someone else in another country to help us make payment. Okay, so the fact that there is a money transfer limitation is one of the reasons why crypto in Africa is so important. So for me, it stands as a tool for economic freedom or financial freedom. Thank you. Thank you very much for that response. Yeah. Chain analysis, a blockchain analytics platform, released a report last month, a global index report of crypto. Nigeria and Kenya have been the leading countries in the blockchain world in Africa. But Nigeria and Kenya dropped out of that list in the 2022 index. So, according to the reports, the reason why Nigeria and Kenya dropped out is because there are no institutional players in Nigeria. We only have retail traders, people that just want to make crypto and just make money and get out. So, I want to ask Senator Yemi, why, why haven't we been able to... Uh, achieve that scale yet. Why have we be able to get institutional players in the African crypto space? Yes. Um, it's really interesting. I also saw that report by Chainalysis about global crypto adoption. Indeed, um, in 2021, I, I think uh, in the previous year, Nigeria was part of the first 10. Why has Nigeria dropped out along with Kenya and, uh, Kenya and the others? I think that, first of all, the idea that Nigeria is, a, is the largest Africa, you know, the largest um, uh, crypto market in Africa should not be lost on us. That is still a fact. What has changed is that I think that the methodology used by Chainalysis this time was pretty different. Last time, a lot of um, um, uh, leverage or focus was given to peer-to-peer -to -peer transactions and all of that. This time, I think the Chainalysis report focused a lot on um, centralized uh, exchanges, first of all, um, institutional investments as well, and then DeFi. These three aspects are not areas that Nigeria is very competitive. But when you look at um, crypto transactions, right, you're looking more like peer-to-peer -peer transactions, P2P. Nigeria is big there. So I think that is one of the reasons or major reasons why Nigeria dropped out from the first 10 to, um, to 11. But let's not take it for granted because if you look at all of those countries, for instance, China, which is over one point something billion people, 1.4, is 10, just a step away from Nigeria. So it means that Nigeria still plays very, um, I mean, plays big in the crypto space. What is happening right now is that we're seeing restrictions. For instance, we know that in 2021, last year, February, the Central Bank of Nigeria prohibited crypto transactions in the banking and financial system. That has significantly affected the level you know, Nigeria would have gotten to if we were having banks openly facilitate you know, or facilitate crypto transactions. Secondly, the regulators are not really accommodating crypto um, yet in the mainstream. Although now we have the Securities and Exchange Commission come up with the um, new rules which regulates the crypto markets as far as investment and securities is, con is concerned. But we are yet to see the central bank, which is the whale in the financial services industry, adopt um, a regulatory framework that accommodates innovators, you know, Quidax, um, um, White Beats, and the rest of them, they need to be brought to the round table. When you have that kind of conversation going on with the, these guys, you will find that, of course, 
the rates of adoption will grow. Yeah, thank you very much for that response. But Senator, there are, there are restrictions in China. And you would, you would agree with me that they have market movers who will use institutional adoption, even with the restrictions. So why has Nigeria not been able to achieve that? <laughs> okay, it, it needs to be clear, first of all, right? China is one of the biggest markets when it comes to crypto. Let's get that right. In terms of infrastructure, China is in there. Talk about the mining pools. China is in there. Nigeria is nowhere near that. So the, the restrictions happening in China, with all the restrictions, China still got to the first 10. But what I'm trying to say is, Nigeria, China, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of um, institutional in investments, it's just not a part at all. So we need to appreciate that. We are just about 213 million people, or 218. China is 1.4, and this is a country that has invested a lot in their um, technology, innovation, and all the rest of that. We need to also invest in our infrastructure. Thanks for that response. Still on the reports, according to the metrics, the, the top 10 of the list, the top 10 countries from the list came from lower, lower middle income countries. Then the, Eight countries from the top 20 came from upper middle income. Only two came from higher income countries. Can we attribute this fact that, okay, crypto is a, is a solution to financial security? Can we feel that? Or that is just not too good? The early days of the movement, and that guy didn't cash out for like 20, 30 years ago. And this guy is running some big millions of dollars today uh, with his investment. And so, how do you convince him? You see, when someone comes into crypto, the first thing first is to actually know why, why, why crypto. What is this thing we're doing with crypto? When I got into crypto 2016. I keep using this, my example, as a perfect template for newbies. So I got into crypto uh, when I had someone in Calabar who is using a betting platform. He needed to wire money to the UK. And 
as an affiliate of the betting company works for. They either use perfect money or Bitcoin. And I keep on hearing that they're like, oh, Bitcoin is scarce, Bitcoin is scarce. And that's how I got to hear about Bitcoin. And I went on my own to start doing research. And for 12 good hours, for 12 good hours, I was on YouTube watching Andreas Antonopoulos. I was 6 p.m. on the Friday evening. I didn't know when I was because I'm a very voracious person. I'm a very voracious reader. I like to research and I kept on watching different things. Andreas was talking about how you can hold the phone and the bank can't stop you from transferring money from Brazil to Yugoslavia. I said, what? You mean no central authority for the first time in history? And that alone triggered my passion and my entry into crypto. So I have to start with that. And of course, you want to make money. You want to start making those bucks. So the next thing is you want to go into trading, transfer of money, OTC, different things. Whether you make money or you lose money in crypto, it has not changed that this is what crypto stands for first. And if you're going into trading, that one now requires another skill set on its own. The problem is that we see law as a skill. We see uh, people who do electrical work as a skill. But when it comes to crypto, we think it's a fast money making venture that I just come in and I cash out without me trying to know the basics or the skill behind this. And I keep saying this, that the crypto market is the new money market. Whether we've lost $2 trillion in the market this year or not, if you sit down and take this year, this bear market season, to master the technicals and the fundamentals behind crypto trading, who told you big traders don't even lose their money? The big, the big, big guys, who told you they don't also lose their money? So you know that this is what happens with losses, this is what happens with gain. And let me tell you one thing, if you're a newbie, Give yourself the next one to three years. Train yourself well in crypto to not go out on Twitter and crying about the losses. Some of us you see here today who are sitting to talk to you about crypto, we've had some, men. there's no way there's no losses. Even the guys running the exchanges, even they kill their own losses in the game. So you know that you're trading, some of us have had multiple six figure losses that we still come to Twitter and tell you, we know what is in this game, it's still crypto. And we still are in this game. When you master this skill, let me tell you something coming in Africa that has not really happened. And I do not think we have enough skill manpower for it. In Singapore today, we have hedge funds who are raising the billions and they are hiring Gen Z's as traders in house to trade for them. It's happening in Dubai, it's happening in different countries. I mean, a DeFi analyst and trader could be earning as high as 100,000 US dollars in JP Morgan. Okay? We have these skills coming. Don't think that when you just come to crypto, I want to turn my $5 to $1,000 immediately. That shouldn't be the goal first. The goal should be you learning mastery, having mastery. Somebody who goes to medical school loses time. But in crypto here in Africa or Nigeria, we want to do it fast. I would want to emphasize so the losses does not invalidate the growth in the industry. If you're in crypto, go back to the year 2000 and read what happened in the financial market. Go back to 2008, read what happened in the financial market. The crashes did not change the industry. That's why I respect Michael Celo. And that's why crypto leaders laugh at Michael Celo for buying the team. I laugh. Michael Celo was there before you. Michael Celo was analyzing Apple stock before you were born. Michael Celo was holding Apple stock for like 10 years when people were living dumping Apple stock. He was there during the dot com bubble. He was there after, he was the only stocks when it was dying, till the team came back again to life and in more games. So if you want to understand, if you want to really be playing this industry, have a long term perspective. So that today, if you lose $100, you won't go on, you won't go on, on Twitter and start saying, Chris, I didn't tell that she had that crypto, and now the thing is a scam. I'm not thanking God that those people told me that they want to buy Bitcoin at 60000 and they didn't reply their messages. Now I go on my WhatsApp and send me messages, so, oh, hi, how are you doing? And I'm thanking God that since 2000, 69000 when they ask me to should I buy now, I'll just like, okay, I'll get back to you. And I think that was the best response I ever had. Thank you. Thank you so much for that.
I'll direct this question to one of our vice presidents, Sandy Peter, CEO of the year. Are you here with us? Sandy Peter. All right, then let's move on. I'll direct this question to Chiyo Koro. Since we've seen losses already in the digital market this year, people are confused. Should we sell, or should we buy, or should we vote? So where exactly should we be at this point? You want me to give financial advice? Yes. <laughs> we don't do that here. Um, I think Chris has said, Chris has said um, a lot of it. And Akka has all said it um, when he was speaking. Typically, when you when you are going to buy crypto, you you determine why you're going to buy crypto, right? If you want to make money out of it, Personally, me, me, if I want to make money out of something and I said, okay, I'm going to buy Bitcoin or Litecoin, if it is low, I wouldn't go out until I make money out of it. Right? That's a personal choice. Now, different people have, and I also understand and respect that different people have their own circumstances in life. If I bought Bitcoin at 60,000, today Bitcoin is 19k, and I had to pay my medical bill, and that was the only thing that I had, I would sell it. So it really depends on your own circumstances, it depends on why you got it in the first place, right? Um, so it's really a personal choice. I think it's very, very tough for someone to advise you um, on what to do per time. It really depends on your, on your personal situation. So we should not buy anything. <laughs> we don't do financial services. Do your own research, right? Do your own research. Do your own research. So I'll direct the next question to another one of my speaker, Osami De Arimumi, CEO of PGX. Are you here with us? All right, we have a question then. The next question is. So your expert have suggested that before this crypto winter can be over, there has to be a reduction, a reduction in the rates of the special plan. As an expert that have said that, that before this crypto winter can be over, there should be a reduction in rates by the US special plan. But people with the technology behind blockchain is backed by decentralization. So why should the technology that is backed by decentralization rely on the traditional plan? Uh, okay. If I thought the question right, is uh, that experts are suggesting that for this winter market to pass, uh, the US feds have to reduce their rates, you know, and if that's the case, why is uh, the traditional finance market uh, basically influencing uh, the price of? Bitcoin is decentralized, right? Um, no. First of all, uh, experts have been wrong plenty in life. No, no. So, so, so that's something to uh, well state uh, clearly. That's one. Two, whether something is decentralized or not, at the end of the day, uh, the primary principle that determines where things um, Price-wise, especially, is demand and supply, and so the assumption there is, if the rates reduce, um, the people are no longer interested in, you know, investing their funds in, you know, the primary money markets, and then those funds then find their way into cryptocurrency, and that assumption is also based on uh, things that's happened in the past. So yeah, cryptocurrency is decentralized. But demand and supply affects price, and that's a base principle. On top of every other, many other things that are pretty complex, you know, that also affect principle. So if um, a massive economy like the U.S. makes a move that makes people 
look for alternative or better yielding products. And of course, Bitcoin has proven to be um, a top alternative for um, gain in its short time. It's also important to remember how young this home space is. If that's the case, then um, that reduction can cause an increase in price. But uh, the question, specific, just to go specifically with your question, was that what caused the winter market that we're in right now? Not necessarily. So, um, like I said at the beginning, experts have been wrong, but the whole idea of that one move causing an increase in demand and possibly you know, ending the winter market, there's a possibility there, but no one can say for sure. But the important thing is, the market is driven by demand and supply, so anything that affects demand and supply would affect the market, cryptocurrency or anything else in the world. Thanks for the response. So, I'd like to ask something. I'm sorry. See, this is the question about if Bitcoin is decentralized, why is this economy, why is a lot more streets affected? And I think I have to address that because a lot of movies are speeding up stops. And people outside creep back, like, okay, if Bitcoin is truly decentralized, why is there a lot more streets today? There will be a deep. Okay. He has answered that thing very well, but a lot of people miss the decentralized explanation of Bitcoin. It is about the technology, not about the price. Okay, the price, like he said, is demand and supply. This year, people are going to hard cheap. Let's start with that first. In Nigeria alone, so that could have back to that much, and you know they only up staff and they lose their money. And so, by then they start laying off people, people can't buy iPhones, they can't buy food enough. This world becomes too square. You start, you, the last thing you think of is how to buy Bitcoin. So, that's when you see all this CPI, data release, demand, the consumer index. They're trying to tell you that, see, people are not buying things like before, because there's a global economic crunch. Now, does it affect Bitcoin negatively or positively? The technology is still there. The hash rate is still increasing. China will ban, Nigeria will ban, all the ban and the ban and the ban. The technology is still there. But as for price, pricing will be affected. Why? Because me and you, just like, look at what happened uh, some hours ago, when a uh, 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 celebrity was here. They asked how many of you put $1 million on Bitcoin. On Bitcoin. Like, almost, I think the, the crowd, only 20%. That's the reflection of what's going on in the global economy. And it's how many people put money in real estate to buy a house in Lekki. Almost everybody. So it's showing that people are going to try to invest in risk on assets because there's panic, there's no demand like that. And of course, only a few are doing that. So when demand is less, prices will reduce. So it's, it's a simple mathematics that has nothing to do with the real technology of what Bitcoin stands for. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll direct the next question to our uh, nice papers. Sandy Peter, are you here now? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here from the beginning. <laughs> Just couldn't hear me wrong. Alright, thanks for joining me. Yeah, so, regardless of what we've been through, there's still hope. We still believe people will be back. So, I'll ask Peter, when do you see the next wave will come and when exactly should we buy? The next oh, one. Yes, I, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, so right now, how I see the, the global markets, um, it's 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 actually in the hands of two people right now. So uh, the one is from Russia, and the other one is actually from uh, from uh, the U.S. Right. So and right now, the majority of things I think are kind of um, gathering from the macro economic politics uh, from you know JP. And uh, it, it's going to come down when the, when the U.S. Fed actually pivots. So when they start, um, let's say, not, not reducing the interest rates, but maybe not uh, hiking them so much. And um, when that's going to happen, you know, my personal opinion, it's going to be pretty, pretty soon. It could be even in October or, or next month. Uh, just what, we, what we're seeing right now is the global economy like cracking down, it's, it's, uh, we've seen, uh, 
uh, of course, the adoption of Bitcoin as a legal tailor in that country does not um, uh, simply equate to a better regulatory environment, right? Um, in Nigeria, yes, uh, and Africa generally, we have seen inconsistencies when it comes to the regulatory approach to crypto adoption. Um, we look at a place like South Africa, for instance. South Africa, when, as soon as they, they realized that South Africans were getting interested in crypto and all of that, the first thing they had to do was to get the um, regulators in from the uh, tax uh, sector, from the banking sector, from the uh, security sector as well, to look at the risk around that part and see how best they could get in. They said something, and this is very important for every regulator across Africa. They believe that cryptocurrencies like Ethereum, Bitcoin, and the rest of them are basically financial products. So if they are financial products, it means that they can be accommodated and regulated as well. Um, go to places like, a place like Nigeria, for instance. The Central Bank's initial approach back in 2017 was, all right, we can allow banks facilitate these transactions, but ensure that we have KYC in place. And the banks were following that. That changed in 2021 because of the misunderstanding and misconception around the use of cryptocurrencies for facilitating money laundering, uh, terrorism, and all that illicit transactions. Now we know, it's clear now, that according to the uh, uh, g analysis report in 2021, 2020 as well, it showed very clearly that less than 1% of the global crypto transaction have been traced to illicit or illegal transaction, meaning that whatever reason or misconception that banks or central banks across Africa have about Bitcoin and crypto, it's not valid based on the figures and facts out there. So what we need to do, I think, is to get back to the round table, to the drawing board. And we need to also get to the round table. One of the things that we have failed to do in Africa from a regulatory perspective is to ensure that we get the players in the room. So we should have the players, the Bitmans, the Quidax, the White Pits, the Lunos. They need to be the ones having a conversation with the regulators. But what we have found is that it's usually the other way around. How do I mean? Rather than call the industry players themselves, regulators call the TradFi players, the banks, and say, let's talk about this. How do you have a conversation about crypto adoption with traditional finance players? So we need to have industry players also brought into the room. Um, from CIMA, the Stakeholders and Blockchain Association of Nigeria, we have tried to facilitate that conversation. So far, uh, the success we have had has been at the securities and exchange level, which is one of the reasons why today, in May of this year, the Securities and Exchange Commission issued a regulation in that sector. We now need to have the central bank also come in. I'm happy to say that at the monetary policy of the central bank in Lagos, sometime in June or July, the central bank governor, Governor Mifele himself, acknowledged that it was time the monetary policy of the country changed. Because today we are seeing the platforms and he even mentioned cryptocurrencies. Where do we go from here? We think that regulators are beginning to understand that they might have made some serious errors initially. This is now the time to get back to the drawing board and have open, transparent and, um, and clear conversations. And I'm happy 
my players in the, in the space today are even more prepared to have that conversation. Well, thank you so much for your response. I would like the next question to our nice speaker, Sadie. Like Senator mentioned, cryptocurrency is becoming a haven for for start and criminals. In view of this, do you think we need to see regulation in Nigeria? You can. Osamidi, if you can hear us, we can hear you. Should be told. 
Nigeria is the most enthusiastic about crypto from Africa. I must say that. And I think we should clap for ourselves because of that. You see, uh, go to Twitter today. In the least, it's not even feeling like a bear market in Nigeria crypto Twitter. The only thing you can see are people are still fighting and so maybe toxic and all those things. Of course, you get that. But you want to know people are still going on Solana NFT to go and look for NFTs? Nigerians are there. You want to go on Ethereum, trying to do this one? Nigerians are there. You want to go on that same thing that you see people writing trends, writing this, trading futures, trading sports, still trying to do everything to earn a living through crypto. Nigerians are still there. So if young people in this age bracket between 16 to 30 to 40 are still in crypto, then the future of crypto in Nigeria or in Africa is still bright. The only thing we are conversing for, just like what you mentioned earlier on, and set it out to compare it to what's going on in China, is that one of the things we still need, uh, I don't know if I should measure it as that institutional power. Okay, we want to see the rise of ABC Venture Capital coming to say we've raised a hundred million dollar fund owned by Africa for Africa. All these ones, all these companies are coming with some sort of venture capital scams. They're investing three hundred million million in Africa. When you check the companies they're investing in, you keep wondering what's going on. Okay, they just package a Web3 project that they're using Web3 to ship clothes from Umaya to Aba. And that's what kind of thing we're talking about. When we have our own in-house, our own country, that's why you see venture capital companies in China. They are still packing their, uh, their, their, their mining companies. If they chase them away from China, they send them to America. The money is still going like that. We need such. We need that inflow of institutional capital that will help drive adoption, that will help drive projects from here. To the, to, to the other parts of the world. So the future is bright for us in Africa. Thank you very much. You mentioned, you said, you should have to change your government. I would have loved to ask, because we have about 10 million I can miss it. I would have asked for what happened as a company. Can I just have a question and answer? Can you have a candidate, please? Can I just have a question and answer session? A session for none now. I need to have a sponsor of a session now. So after that, we need to ask some questions and write your questions as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please let's put our hands together for the panels and panelists once again. I'm very sure we can keep better. Let's put our hands together for them. I want to encourage all of you to please go on social media and use the hashtag, hashtag TNC2022. Let's make it a trending topic. The information and the discussions we've had are extremely critical to progress. We need to share that, we need to get it out there. So as much as possible, please use the hashtags. Also need to remind us that our vendors are there, the food and the water and the drinks are for sale, so please patronize them as much as, as, much as you can. We'll have our sponsors video coming up next, and thereafter we'll have our question and answer session for only five questions. Five questions. Can I just ask our panelists to take our selfie? Yes, please. Please use each of your phones. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah, do it. As a young guy, I tried to take it to the project industry. 
what do you think uh, when do you think someone can start your phone? Or what aspect? I can't hear you well, please. I said as a young guy trying to break into the blockchain industry, um, what aspect do you think is very nice to start with traffic from and then from and from where you can solve and then process from? If I hear you, where to start from, right? Yes, I will. Has somebody got to get into the blockchain industry? Okay, so, uh, Fred, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I don't know, maybe later today, maybe on my Twitter, uh, there's something I used to share with back 2019, 20, where I give a list of uh, basics of Bitcoin, Ethereum, and just list all of them like that. But if you go to www.cryptohub.com, uh, my education platform, we package a whole lot of freebies where you can learn various things for free, okay, when you're getting started in crypto. Now, YouTube is also one good place for you. There are lots of free resources in crypto that you can get started with. Like I said earlier on, understand the mission. And when you, when you do that, the next is now, where do you think I can fit in? There are a lot of branches in crypto. There are a lot of branches in the crypto industry that you can play in, okay? Uh, you may necessarily not decide to be a trader, okay? You may just be a holder, and I'm even seeing that a part of the market that a lot of people are not taking advantage of is video content creation in the crypto industry. No one will take advantage of it. Okay, there are brands you can partner with to do that. You can run a five-day negotiation to this business because I'm bringing that proposal to this guy. Do that. <laughs> okay, so, so there are several industries you can have. So when you get in, let the basics start. Uh, make sure you turn off one or two, three practicals. If they say there's lending protocol in the fact, you to use the AAV protocol, use the compound protocol, use your one dollar to borrow a loan and whatever, just do something with it. So there's a lot of good resources on YouTube you can start with that will help you a lot. I think that is it. Next question, please. Good afternoon. My name is Mary, Mary Maswan, and my question really is ordered on the fact that I find it quite disturbing that people in the crypto space are not talking about the adoption that or the utility of cryptocurrency. We see we talk up here a lot about the problems but not the utility. For example, there was made mention of the Central African Republic about them adopting Bitcoin as a contender. I mean there are lots of advantages that this could bring to Africa. In terms of your question, like lots of people talk about utility. I know we are very big on utility where we can have that we can help you send and receive money using crypto. And this is um, across Africa and also internationally, right? This is not just within Africa. So most times, while you hear people talk about trading, 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 and even pricing, because even when I came, I don't know, where is David? Uh, after now, I even wanted to ask you, you didn't talk more about utility, you were just talking about the up and down of the price of Bitcoin. And rest that it has a lot more to crypto and the whole blockchain um, in itself. So you see, that's why she's asking um, that question. But there's lots and lots of utility. You can use it to make um, B2B payments, remittance, sending and receiving of money, um, crypto cards. It is, yeah, there's a whole lot. And that was why I was also uh, very particular that any regulation that is coming shouldn't strike through innovation because there, there is a lot that we will not even yet explore. So if someone should just go and sit down somewhere and bring a regulation that uh, will strike through this innovation, it's going to affect all of us at the end of the day. Thank you so much.